one of the most popularly depicted and heavily romanticized periods of history, the Golden Age of Piracy, came about as a result of various factors in the Caribbean and along the east coast of North America. However, the illegal piracy of the 18th century, much like the Wild West period of the United States, was shorter than one might expect, and was an era less of individual rogues gaining their fortune through illicit means, but instead was a microcosm of democracy and a functioning government that sought to escape the rule of oppressive powers that valued their lives less than that of their cargo, even willing to pay the ultimate price for their one chance at freedom. Piracy, also known as privateering, has existed for thousands of years across the globe, although privateering in its most famous incarnation came about following the discovery of the New World by primarily Spanish explorers in the 15th and 16th centuries, during which it was found that these lands were laden with exceptional wealth and gold stores that could bolster the economies of the rapidly emerging European empires. The gold trade, therefore, truly began in the wake of the Conquistadors' campaign to overthrow the rule of the ancient tribal factions in Central and South America before plundering the treasures of their cities, perhaps the most famous example being the destruction of the Aztecs in 1521 at the hands of Hernán Cortés, who used the captured wealth of this once mighty empire to fund the expansion of Spain and its war against the English. Under the rule of the English queen, Elizabeth I, interception of the Spanish gold trade was an opportunity to not only disrupt the economy of her enemies to the south, but to also bolster her own economy as a means of expanding the international influence of England into the New World, specifically North America. Therefore, as the Royal Navy was engaged in defending England from the most immediate threat posed by the Spanish, as per the Spanish Armada of 1588, the naval authorities offered merchant ships the opportunity to conduct raids against the Spanish gold trade as private entities, receiving substantial rewards from the British state for every ship captured and their cargo taken as booty. Thus, the age of the privateers was born, and hundreds of individual ships set out into the Atlantic to hunt down and intercept Spanish gold galleons, the effectiveness of the privateers meaning the Spanish could be thwarted from two fronts, with the Royal Navy halting their planned conquest of England and the privateers cutting off their vital gold supplies from the Americas. For this reason, combined with a tradition of incestual relationships within the Spanish royal family that led to monarchs of ever-decreasing physical and mental abilities, the Spanish Empire rapidly faced decline against the emerging powers of Britain and France, culminating in the War of Spanish Succession between 1701 and 1715, which was caused by a succession crisis between Philip of Anjou and Charles of Austria, who called upon the support of their respective allies in Spain itself, Austria, France, the Dutch Republic, Savoy and Great Britain. With France and Britain being set against each other in the wider conflict, as they took sides with differing factions vying for the Spanish throne, the war would spill over into the colonies of North America during what was known as Queen Anne's War, where the French possessions of New France did battle with the colonies of British America. With war taking place on both land and at sea, a significant naval force needed to be amassed that saw widespread conscription and press-ganging among the working classes of Britain, with thousands of men being drafted aboard Royal Navy ships in extremely harsh conditions to do battle with French corsairs out on the churning North Atlantic, life being very cheap among the ranks of the Navy at the time, with equipment and ships being far more valuable than the crews who manned them. Ultimately, Queen Anne's War ended in 1713 with the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht, at which point thousands of mobilised naval crew were immediately put out of work in the trade-rich Caribbean and North America, though opportunities and conditions in civilian life were no better than what they had experienced in the ranks of the Royal Navy. Merchant vessels, for instance, operated on extremely tight profit margins, and thus in order to squeeze as much money as possible out of every voyage, conditions for their crews, as well as the number of men manning the ships in general, were slashed to reduce overhead, most merchantmen being operated by what were essentially skeleton crews, performing the duties of what would normally have been a full ship's complement. At around this time, the North Atlantic slave trade emerged as one of the most profitable businesses on the high seas, with tens of thousands of African captives being transported en masse to the New World so as to work in bondage on the sugarcane and cotton plantations of the Caribbean and North America. However, as the ship's owners considered slaves' profit and crew expenses, the humans being transported below decks in cramped, inhumane conditions were determined to carry a far higher monetary value than the ship's complement, and thus the mortality rate per voyage stood at a staggering 30% due to drownings, disease, malnourishment, and injury from the unsafe working conditions aboard ship. As mentioned, both crews and slaves alike were seen as subhuman by the ship's masters, and any member of the crew either killed in their duties or lost at sea was considered a bonus as it saved the need to pay their wages, while any slave lost was a drop in potential sales profits, 
the ire of dead slaves being impressed upon the crew through arbitrary punishments and sometimes even summary executions. Thus, as per the situation in around 1715 in the Caribbean, there were now thousands of unemployed sailors demobilized after Queen Anne's War who sought to gain income by any means other than that of the cruel and oppressive merchant or slave ships, the results of which led to the beginning of the Golden Age of Piracy. In many cases, pirate vessels came about as a result of a mutiny by merchant crews against their masters, the prospect of death by hanging for their rebellion being of little concern when compared to their regular brushes with death in the employ of merchant shipping lines, although despite the suffering of sailors aboard cargo vessels, only around 4,000 out of the tens of thousands of merchant crews would ever turn to piracy during the Golden Age. Having learned tactical abilities and skills through their involvement with the Royal Navy, the pirates were perfectly equipped to undertake raiding campaigns across the North Atlantic and the Caribbean, spurred on by the opening of the previously closed Spanish colonies of Central and South America to British trade as an outcome of the War of Spanish Succession, thus seeing oceanic trade boom and hundreds of defenseless merchant ships now ripe for capture. The first recorded pirate attack in the period following the end of the Spanish War of Succession took place in mid-1715, following the destruction of the treasure fleet, when 11 Spanish galleons laden with silver and gold bound for Europe were sunk off the Florida coast by a hurricane, killing over 1,500 people and leaving vast sums of treasure deposited in shallow water. With the Spanish determined to recover the treasure, ships were sent to salvage the wreck for its cargo, at which point a small flotilla of pirate vessels, under the command of Charles Vane, Henry Jennings and Samuel Bellamy, launched an assault on the undefended salvagers, coming away with huge sums of plunder. Initially, the League of Pirates, dubbed the Flying Gang, did not attack British merchant ships, continuing to maintain their essential role as privateers against Spanish galleons laden with treasure, though following the end of the Succession War in 1715, British ships also became a viable target. So sudden was the rise in piracy against the British, that the Royal Navy had few vessels in the Caribbean during peacetime to combat their assault, the usual patrol of small frigates being heavily outgunned by the extremely well-organized pirates, who even established a chain of command similar to that of the Navy itself, with Commodores taking charge of multiple vessels to coordinate surgical strikes. Unfortunately, the captured booty, especially once British ships began falling victim to the pirates, could not be sold in any of the colonies without drawing the attention of the local law enforcement, the main base of British authority in the Caribbean being Kingston on the island of Jamaica, which strictly forbade the trade of plundered goods among its population. In the past, Port Royal, also on Jamaica, had been the primary location for privateers wishing to spend captive Spanish gold and cargo, but in June 1692, a devastating 7.5 magnitude earthquake, accompanied by a tsunami, laid waste to the town with the cumulative deaths of around 2,000 people, leading ultimately to the establishment of Kingston as the new capital of the island colony. In the end, the pirates opted to use the abandoned town of Nassau on the uninhabited island of New Providence as their main trading post, this island forming part of the British claimed Bahamas, and had been deserted since 1704 following an assault by the Spanish and French as part of the War of Succession during which large portions of the harbour were burned and the remainder thoroughly looted. Nassau proved to be ideally located, with dozens of coves and natural harbours, meaning the repurposed shallow draft merchant vessels could venture where the deep water warships of the Royal Navy could not, while at the same time being located within close proximity to the main shipping routes between South America and Europe, allowing for easy access to lightly defended merchant ships. The general strategy of the pirates during the Golden Age was to anchor in hidden coves near major harbours and thereby intercept departing merchant vessels shortly after they had entered the open ocean, undertaking precision ambushes that could be conducted in only a few minutes, rapidly transferring goods onto the pirate vessel and making a hasty getaway before a naval counterattack could be organised. Therefore, Nassau became one of the most important centres for pirate activity during the early 18th century, with pirate captains Thomas Barrow, Henry Jennings and Benjamin Hornigold becoming de facto governors of what they declared as the Republic of Pirates, as established in 1706, which was complemented by a loosely defined system of government. Initially, the Republic of Pirates proved difficult to manage due to internal conflicts between the differing pirate leaders, though eventually the three governors of Nassau could unify their comrades together under laws that were similar to those of the Pirate Code, which did in fact allow for the establishment of a political entity under which the pirates could operate. According to the Pirate Code, there was a democratic system of government where loot was to be shared equally, captains and leaders could be deposed by popular vote, and the political ideology was akin to that of libertarianism as a response to the tyranny and abuse suffered by the crews of former merchant vessels and the Royal Navy. 
Furthermore, the Republic of Pirates was also one of the first political systems to allow for racial equality, as when intercepting slave ships traveling between Africa and the Americas, the slaves aboard would be set free and allowed the opportunity to join the pirate faction as crew. Therefore, several former African slaves would become pirate captains in their own right, such as Black Caesar. While due to this new government openly opposing the perceived oppression of the British imperial system, other displaced political enemies of the UK government joined the ranks of the Pirate Republic, including exiled Jacobites, who sought to restore the recently deposed family of Stuart to the English throne. Soon, Nassau had become the heart of Caribbean piracy, with a population of 2,000 occupying what was essentially a lawless town of vice paid for by plunder, with gambling, drunkenness and prostitution being staples of the town's economy, together with an effective ship repair and maintenance business at the harbour, while in order to get the best views across the surrounding ocean, a tower was built on the highest point of the island so as to observe any ships passing nearby that were worth harassing. However, such a life of freedom and excess in Nassau couldn't last long, and within five years the town's strategic position meant the pirates had practically crippled trade in the Caribbean, warranting a response from the British Empire, who dispatched Woods Rogers as acting royal governor to the Bahamas in 1718. Offering a king's pardon, Rogers allowed any pirate the chance to turn over a new leaf and be granted amnesty in the eyes of the king if they renounced their crimes, an option taken by many as it meant they could essentially retire in luxury and not be faced with the inevitability of the gallows, among those choosing to abandon the life of a pirate being one of Nassau's governors, Benjamin Hornigold. However, not all were willing to go down without a fight, and in response to those refusing the offer of the king's pardon, Woods sent royal marines ashore to occupy the island while three ships of the line would blockade Nassau Harbour. In order to break the blockade, the pirates set adrift a captured French galleon laden with explosives that drew the attention of the Royal Navy's fleet, the vessel eventually detonating in a vivid display of fireworks that was cheered on by the pirates still ashore in Nassau, while in the confusion, several ships were able to slip away into the Atlantic under cover of darkness. Ultimately, Nassau was taken by the Royal Marines, and those who remained in the town were promptly rounded up and sentenced to death by hanging. Although as a last offer of clemency, the king's pardon could be provided to those pirates who joined the navy in tracking down their former comrades, Henry Jennings and Benjamin Hornigold being two of the more famous pirate hunters. With Nassau now under British control, the pirate fleet was dispersed far and wide across the West Indies, and without a safe haven for these crews to spend their plunder, together with the Royal Navy increasing the number of patrols in the Caribbean, it was clear that the golden age of piracy was facing its end as the 1720s dawned. Those pirates who refused the king's pardon were gradually hunted down and either captured or killed, with crews and captains taken alive, given brief show trials before they were hanged, their bodies being displayed in public places as a deterrent to others who had romantic notions as to this line of work. With the number of Royal Navy ships of the line in the Caribbean having increased from two in 1670 to 124 by 1718, the British won nearly all of their confrontations with pirate raiders, and such were the huge number of pirates being brought in for trial that the British government created seven new commissioners whose sole purpose was to try all piracy-related cases, these trials being quick and offered no legal representation to the prisoners, with the result that nearly 10% of the pirates in the Caribbean were ultimately hanged, equating to around 600 men. For the survivors, in the face of the Royal Navy gaining so much influence over the oceans of the globe, and with new merchant ships themselves being designed with a strong defence in mind, they chose instead to quietly abandon their criminal career and would return to Europe seeking a legal source of income. Therefore, classical piracy by the mid-1700s was on the path to its demise all over the world, with raiders of the Indian Ocean and the Barbary Coast also being rooted out and crushed by far superior naval forces, while the incentive to require privateers in general during times of war were rendered obsolete through the creation of dedicated fleets with crews employed by the government rather than being hired mercenaries. Come the 1800s, and the start of the Industrial Revolution that saw steam replace sail, this ultimately spelled the definitive end of widespread piracy across the globe, with faster ships and higher populations inhabiting the once remote regions of the world, now meaning no successful pirate operation could be conducted without it being easily uncovered, while any attempt to escape law enforcement was impossible due to the speed of the Royal Navy's improved line of warships against the sluggish merchantmen of the previous century. Thus, the golden age of piracy, despite being depicted as a time of lawlessness and romantic freedom from the chains of an oppressive system, was in fact one that came about due to thousands of demobilized sailors seeking to escape the often dangerous life at sea experienced in the ranks of the navy and the merchant fleets.
However, rather than being simply individual bandits roaming the ocean waves for defenseless cargo ships, there was a true system of democracy and libertarian principles among the pirate leadership that ensured the plunder they took was divided equally, and would not lead to pirates being set against pirates in a self-destructive civil war. Ultimately, it was the impact of the pirates on the British businesses of the Caribbean, particularly the slave trade, that invoked the wrath of the Royal Navy, and once more assets had been allocated to the destruction of the pirate force, it was only a matter of time before they were rooted out of their hideaways and destroyed on the open sea, eventually seeing order restored to the waves of the Spanish main.